It was in this moment that Momonosuke decided to unleash his ultimate technique. Breast Dragon Activate! Hello and welcome to the Grand Line Review, your source for everything One Piece, and today we have a review of chapter 1007, also known as quite possibly one of the biggest twists that One Piece has ever thrown at us. So look, this time the title of the video is not hyperbole because what happened here is madness, utter, utter madness. And as much as the chapter does focus on Chopper and gives him some much, much needed glory, there is only one possible place where we can begin this review, and that place is actually a man, I think, and his name is Kozuki Oden. All right, so who's it gonna be? Hiori, Toki, Enaru? Nope, none of those, it's Oden. And I should probably say at this point that I was spoiled pretty damn hard on Odin appearing in this chapter. Whenever huge mind-blowing revelations happen, it is absolutely impossible for me to avoid them. I get bombarded with spoilers openly on Twitter, through DMs, in my channel comments, on Facebook, on Discord, etc, etc. And some are malicious actors trying to spoil me and succeeding, I suppose, but some are fairly innocent as well. Doesn't matter, either way, I am never able to avoid information like this. The only possible way to do so would be to quite literally stay off the internet for half a week because spoilers tend to start floating around on Wednesdays and well, the official chapter doesn't get released until the next Monday. So that's that's not really viable. So yeah, I guess I could have done a fake reaction like gasp, Odin, mm, what a what a twist. But uh, you would have all been able to tell pretty easily because I'm a pretty rubbish actor. So I do apologize that you didn't get some sort of mind blown reaction scene. However, this is still a mind blowing event. And you may consider my mind so thoroughly blown that I'm still very much attempting to pick up the shattered fragments of it. For all of the characters for this mysterious silhouette to incarnate as, Odin is probably literally the only one who I never would have guessed. Actually, maybe not. I also wouldn't have guessed Yasu because they are the two characters that we've seen die during this arc. Everyone else who has this implied death is still very much up in the air. And before I go off on a billion different Odin related tangents, I will give Oda all the props in the world for once again, selecting an option that was completely inconceivable to me. And even though this revelation was spoiled, it was still a pretty amazing experience just to see this man again. With that said, we have questions ever so many questions because basically there is one of two ways that this can go from here. Very simply, either this is Odin or it isn't. And even that is not an easy question to answer. So let's begin with the more skeptical approach and posit that this is not in fact Odin. One Piece is no stranger to producing abilities that allow characters to mimic the bodies of others. And I feel like a lot of people are going to jump straight to the conclusion that this may be the Mane Mane no Mi, which I can't blame them for doing, especially since that particular the fruit has actually been part of the Wano arc, that or Katarina Devon's devil fruit, the Inu Inu no Mi model QB. And after having brought both of them up, I'm going to entirely dismiss them. On the off chance that sure, Bonclay has escaped from Impel Down, he still would have had to touch Odin for this fruit to work, and he would need the contextual knowledge of his relationship with the vassals, all of which just, uh, uh it doesn't seem likely. And as for Katarina Devon, an appearance from the Blackbeard faction just seems so out of place at this point, they really should have nothing to do with Wano, and if they did, then why go to the trouble of healing the vassals and constructing this whole complex charade of Odin? And how does Katarina Devon even know who Odin is to begin with, as well as the relationship with his vassals and just like the global placement and motivations do not fit for either of those fruits. Luckily, however, we do have several Wano specific answers available to us. The first thing that came to my mind being Onimaru, the shape-shifting fox that we haven't seen in an awfully long time and who was introduced, assumedly, for reasons. We know far too little about Onimaru's capabilities other than he can shapeshift into at least one other thing, and being a seemingly magical fox, Japanese logic dictates that that could potentially go even further. I mean, that is the entire premise of Katarina Devon's Devil Fruit after all, but I like the Onimaru idea because I'm really waiting for the entire purpose of having introduced his element into this arc. The whole Onimaru experience has been one of a couple of forgotten threads of Wano that really do demand some form of resolution. And also demanding resolution is this alluring subscribe button for the Grand Line Review, your pressing of which will result in consistent injections of One Piece culture administered straight into your YouTube feed. Come on, how could you say no to these eyes? If it's not Onimaru though, there is another idea that I know for a fact could work, which is that Kanjiro is alive and this Kozuki Odin is but a clever drawing. We do know for a fact that Kanjiro could do it. There's just the slight problem that he is allegedly dead. We even saw his body and everything. But then again, I don't know if we should be trusting a professional actor to be telling the truth in this situation. If Oda really wanted it to 
Kandro could just be playing dead, or that corpse could have been an inky copy. Either way, this leaves Kandro potentially available to draw a picture-perfect Odin, which he may do so because his loyalty was strictly to Archie, and Kaido has now betrayed Archie, and Archie is now also allegedly dead, by the way, and I don't trust that either, but that's not what we're talking about here. If these two are alive, then they're left in quite a tricky position, and I could very much see a situation where they decide to push to topple Kaido as revenge. And when I say they, I suppose I mean Archie, because Kandro probably doesn't care. Especially if he's dead. If he's dead, he's not going to care much at all. So those are two very roundabout explanations there, but here's the thing for a twist like this. The answer is almost certainly not going to be simple. You cannot just pull a supposedly dead character right out of your butthole without some extreme shenaniganry. And that only becomes more complicated if this is, in fact, Odin. So the thing here that makes me feel like this might not be Odin is because this feature page doesn't have Oda's trademark character introduction text. Typically, whenever we see characters in a full-bodied artwork for either the very first time or the first time in a long while, they will be accompanied by this grand Oda text. And they tend to transcend the One Piece world in that they always convey truthful information unless it's purely a gag like Gangster Gastino, in which case that still kind of does transcend the world. So if there was this accompanying text that said this was Kozuki Odin, then that would be the end of discussion. But rather annoyingly, we can't tell as much from this as I initially thought we might be able to, because if this is not Odin, Oda obviously won't use that text. And if it is Odin, then as an author wanting to leave this chapter on a cliffhanger, I probably wouldn't use that text here either because you'd want to create the intrigue over who it could be, rather than just confirm that yes, this is Odin right then and there. But let's get to the more exciting discussion now. There's plenty of reasons why it may not be, but what if this is Odin? In that case, the only possible explanation I have is that he was sent forward in time by Toki. Because here's the thing, this presentation of Odin does track. Initially, I thought it was a bit strange looking because Odin tends to wear shorter clothes that are designed to show off his manly hairy legs. But if we do go back to chapter 970, when he and the vassals fought against Kaido, he would appear to have this exact outfit on. And Odin began wearing that in chapter 969, so also annoyingly, all I can say is that if this is Odin, it could be him from any time in the last five years of his life, during the period when he was acting as a fool. However, it was more than likely before the attack on Kaido because he isn't at all wounded. So imagine this sort of situation. For whatever reason, Odin is sent forward in time. He arrives at present day Wano, assists the vassals, and perhaps even the worst generation in defeating Kaido. All is well, Wano is saved, we can move on. However, Odin then has to return to the past with full knowledge of the events to play out 20 years from now. And in the past, he attacks Kaido and gets executed anyway, because that's the only way that this future can possibly come to pass. And that's the sort of thing that would explain why he was able to tell Toki with such profound certainty that there would not be anyone capable of stopping Kaido for exactly 20 years. And also why Toki was able to concoct her prophecy directly from Odin's words. And also, also why Odin can die with a smile on his face because he knows that Kaido will eventually fall. Plus just another crackpot idea to throw into things. We, or I suppose maybe I should say, that I have been consistently speculating over who this ninth shadow of Toki's prophecy is. It's very problematic because even if it does refer to the entirety of the worst generation present on the island, that is only a eight members. We are missing but one single shadow. And I don't know, I think that adding Kozuki Odin into that shadow mix sounds pretty damn fun for a grand total of nine. Now, before I set my sights just a little bit too high, this idea does have problems, a fair few problems. One being that it has been established that Toki can only send people or herself forward into the future, not back into the past. So right now, there would be no mechanism for Odin to travel back in time in order to complete his ultimate fate. Although something like this can be easily fixed by Odin expanding upon the fruit and going, well, actually, it can work differently, but only under this circumstance or whatever. It's not something that would be at all difficult to write his way out of. Something that may be a bit trickier that I should probably bring up at this stage is also the clear factor that Odin does not possess either of his swords, being Enma or the Ame no Habakiri. And if he was sent forward in time, then you'd think he'd probably want to take those with him. And with this one, I don't have any particularly great explanation for. I mean, I did briefly think that he would have left them behind intentionally after maybe seeing Zoro use Enma, but then again, Odin wouldn't know that prior to traveling forward in time, unless he took multiple trips, which just, uh, that just endlessly complicates the idea, and it will no doubt have a much simpler solution, not necessarily simple, but simpler than the sprawling crap that I've just come out with. Uh, time travel only ever complicates stories. It, never simple, it's never simple. Oh, and one more very, very important thing. Odin doesn't necessarily match the silhouette from the end of chapter 1004. In fact, I'd go so far as to say that he doesn't match the silhouette in any way whatsoever. The nose is completely different. Odin doesn't have that little strand of hair or whatever. And most importantly, Odin is nowhere near as small as the big 
figure sitting in front of Ginemon. Which doesn't necessarily prove that this isn't Odin, but it's more to say that even if it is, that silhouette is still an entirely different person. So just putting that out there, because as it turns out, we still have not answered that question. So Toki, Hiyori, and maybe even the meme vote of NL are still very much on the table here. And one last point about Odin, everything I've stated here, even the thoughts that I've dismissed, are not an exhaustive list of possibilities. And in true One Piece fashion, the answer is also something potentially much more left field and completely unexpected, as is Oda's specialty with this series. Now let's talk a bit about narrative consequences, because in World Logic is only one side of this coin. One Piece is a story, and I have to say that if this was not Odin, I'd probably feel a bit disappointed. Creating a cliffhanger like this qualifies as what I like to call a ballsy narrative maneuver. And those are very high risk, high reward, because they are so, so easy to screw up if you fail to make good on the value that you are presenting to a reader or watcher. The value in this case being the presence of the one and only Kozuki Odin. If this is not Odin, then I don't think anyone would be particularly shocked, but I would anticipate quite a bit of disappointment. It would just be such an absurd tease to give us Odin only to take him away and have it be Onimaru or Kanjiro. And at this point, no matter what excuse is given for someone or something assuming Odin's form, I think I'd feel just a little bit cheated. At the same time, that's very much what I'm preparing myself for. So once again, I must reaffirm the idea that I am still thoroughly mind blown. So I really don't know how to feel about this twist. If it is real, then I think we're in for some of the greatest storytelling, action and drama that has ever been featured in One Piece. But if Odin isn't real, then this is false drama purposely crafted as a cliffhanger and it will be nigh on impossible to satisfactorily work our way out of this in the coming chapters. But Odin only formed a tiny, tiny part of chapter 1007, which I've spoken about for probably about as long as a regular entire review. And while I haven't even touched 99% of what happened this week, so I hope you're all keen for a slightly longer video. As we head immediately to Chopper now, because if not for Odin, he would be the undisputed hero figure of this week that we're all talking about about with our mouths and things. In fact, almost this entire chapter is centered around the conflict on the performance floor. And pretty much just as predicted in the last review, Chopper flew in at the last second to save Hyogoro, as well as everyone with his very kawaii cure. <laughs> Come on, this is the most adorable vaccine I've ever seen. Chopper distributing Cure was absolutely one of my favorite moments of 1007, mainly because it heavily evokes the end of Drum Island when Kuroha set off the pink Sakura snowflakes, which I will remind you were intended to warm the frosted hearts of the island's residents. And here we have Chopper doing a very similar thing, only to quite literally warm the hearts of everyone affected by Queen's icy disease. It's a ridiculously perfect parallel and I can't help but love anything that calls back to classic One piece because I saw that panel and I was immediately hit in the balls with pure nostalgia. Not only that, but this whole chapter really does result in a peak to Chopper's New World arc. And you might say, <laughs> what arc? And you'd be pretty within your rights to do so because Chopper still does not get anywhere near enough focus, but it does tie in what little he has done together very neatly. You know, he studied for two years in the Torino kingdom, which is referenced. Then he had his doctors stand on Punk Hazard and Onzo, he worked with Caesar to come up with a cure for the poison gas. And right here and now, all of this knowledge and experience is paying off by being able to speed run a cure for Queen's disease. And let's not undersell this at all. In this moment, Chopper has probably saved this entire raid. There is a big, big, big difference between everyone on the performance floor becoming ice demons and everyone on the performance floor jumping on board with the Alliance like they did. During chapter 1004, where Tama came into focus, I stated that all of the gifters of Kaido's crew were pretty much on our side now. But unfortunately, that still left a ton of waiters and pleasures to deal with, which made up the majority of the crew. And well, well, not anymore. Thanks to Queen being a moron, every waiter and pleasure in this room, which I would wager is a pretty good chunk of them, have now instantly defected and will be fighting on our side. That is an insanely massive blow for the Beast Pirates because they are now rapidly losing the entirety of their forces. Soon, pretty much nobody will be left except for the heavy hitters. And those few that do remain loyal are just being smacked down by flies. By flies, that's not what I meant to say. Like flies, that's what I meant to say. Smack down like flies. I could have just re-recorded it, but chapter reviews are very time sensitive, so I'm not going to. But examples of such flies would be the Oniwa Banshu and the Mima Warigumi. They're both pretty much entirely out of the picture now after doing not much of anything at all. So I'm really, really glad that Oda went to the effort to craft fun and unique designs for all 20 or so of the Oniwa Banshu. That, uh, that paid off. But I think we finally reached that point of critical mass. The flow has now seriously turned in favor of the allied forces, and there are literally only two things currently preventing victory on Onigashima, being Big Mom and Kaido. That is it. 
Although to bring up Queen once again, I loved when he got smacked down by Monster Chopper. It's so satisfying seeing Chopper in action because he is pretty extraordinarily powerful. And whilst he may not be the one to bring Queen down, this panel here is doing Chopper some serious, serious justice. And also a pretty fantastic Tanuki related gag in addition to that. There's just something far too funny about an Allosaurus human hybrid sheepishly covering his mouth. I love faces like these. It reminds me of when Whitebeard did the Odin face in the flashback because no matter how serious a character is, this is one piece and nobody, absolutely nobody, is safe from being turned into a joke. Now, as sort of mentioned earlier, we did have a brief one page scene with the Yamato group where it looks like Momonosuke has gotten over the uh, the thrill of riding Yamato and is having a bit of an internal crisis now. And actually that's really cool to see. It's very hard to argue with a character recognizing their flaws and weaknesses and wanting to be better. It does very much look like he's spawning from Yamato's breasts though, which is pretty funny because Yamato must be beyond shocked at this current development. Why is there a dragon spawning from my cleavage. I did not sign up for this. But I think this might be the start of something very important for Momonosuke and it's all because of the very next scene featuring CP0. Because it would be a mistake to view these as separate scenes. They're more like companion scenes. Without Momo turning into a dragon out of sheer shame, the CP0 part would be out of place. And without the CP0 scene, the Momonosuke one would have been just another thing that happens out of context. But I find it quite interesting that Oda has chosen now to reveal what I think we all pretty much suspected, which is that the artificial devil fruit Momo 8 was based on Kaido's fruit. However, having confirmed that puts us in a very intriguing place because we're now saying that in theory, Momonosuke could be capable of doing anything that Kaido can. Because yeah, the fruit experiment was a failure for undisclosed reasons, but I think this is setting Momonosuke up to have a pretty key role in this conflict in some form after accessing whatever power he can. He won't just be running away and needing to be protected for the rest of the raid because this is a kid who wants to be strong and protect people and stuff. And you know, coincidentally, he just happens to possess a potential copy of one of the most powerful devil fruits in all of existence. So I'm thinking that Momo can definitely make his desires happen. And if you wanna make something happen like some sort of smooth transition, then please do check out this video detailing the lost emperors of One Piece. This world really could have been quite radically altered if a few key events had gone in a slightly different direction. So I look forward to seeing you there.